you a description as a form of a background of the first intruder as was alluded to by the witnesses who in the house. It's just to your benefit because you don't know what what is happening in the case docket. Despite the alarming end to yesterday's court session, I wanted to highlight the work that Um Nisi did yesterday, Advocate Um Nisi did yesterday because, wow, he said, you know what, I had a fantastic day away from court. I want to get this woman to talk because word on the street is all she's saying is, I don't know. I don't know anything. So he starts off with, you know what? Let me bring you up to speed so we can skip through the, I don't know. And he did it so well because he gets, he tells her what the case is all about. Cause he says, you know, she's going to say she doesn't know, but let me tell her what the case is about. So that when I start to ask her questions, she can't say she doesn't know because you will hear, he asked her to agree that she understands what he just told her. Brilliant move, touche. That's going to get her going very, very much um, on and on they go. There's a lot of back and forth between these two. So this video is dedicated to Advocate Mnisi and the things he said that made me laugh out loud. Now, I'm, further on. You are incorrect to say I do not know. I did say there were several statements which I have read. So I have the background of the case. Uh, thank you. Now, further on, <clears throat> I, if my memory serves me well, I think there's a statement that was introduced into evidence when Ms. Temgomizulu, my colleague for accused number one, had a session with you. A statement um, from um, that was deposed to by Mr. Longwetwala. In that statement, he referred to the description of a firearm that was allegedly toted or wielded by the first perpetrator as a three point what is it now, a .38 revolver special. Do you still remember that? I still, uh, I do remember my lot. Thank you. <clears throat> Longetola is a state witness. We are aware of that, not so. Oh, he's listed as one of the witnesses in the, uh, of state witnesses in the list of state witnesses, not so. We are aware of that. That's correct, my lord. It is not in dispute that Mr. Longetwala was one of the occupants, seven occupants, uh, seven adult occupants in the house who witnessed how this incident happened. Do you understand? I understand, my lord. Now, Mr. Toilet, are you aware or do you have a knowledge as to how many statements did Mr. Twala submit in the course of this case? My Lord, uh, I can't say for sure how many, uh, how many statements, but I can confirm, my Lord, that uh, I think it's more than one. Thank you. Now, in one of the statements, <clears throat> that Mr. Twala gave as a witness on how this incident happened. When the state is going to call him, and I've got all the reasons in the world to behave, I mean, to believe that the state is going to call him, because if they don't, we are going to request as a defense that the state should assist us to get hold of Mr. Twala to come and testify for us in the defense case. Uh-oh, shots fired. There goes Nisi again, boldly saying, you know what, Mr. Baloy, I don't even want to hear it. I'm letting you know in advance right here, right now, this guy, Longwetola, is on your witness list. 
I expect him here. My cross-examination is ready. I cannot wait for him to be here because, man, his story keeps changing. One minute, he has his cell phone and he ran out of the house and he pushed in Kavi and he made his way out and he left his whole girlfriend in the house. The next minute, um, suddenly he has his phone and then he shows up at the hospital. But you know what? According to Docket 375, he was shot while being in a scuffle with Senzo Meiwa. His ankle was injured. And I'm going to need him here in this courtroom because I want to see how he walks. Will they make long with Twala take off his shoes to check his ankles? Is it the left ankle or is it the right ankle? Ngomezulu didn't specify, but let me know your thoughts on the ankle situation. Now, that's a challenge that I'm putting. It's a request that I'm providing to the state. Now, amongst others, if the state were to call him in the presentation of their case, this is what he's going to say. If they don't call him and we call him as a defense witness, this is what he will come and say amongst others. That... Um, in his description of the first intruder, that a person who allegedly had a firearm when he got into the house. This is what he's going to say amongst others. Mm. Just as Kelly was about to tell the joke, I noticed the two black guys one tall, light in complexion, and the other one with dreadlocks was short and dark in complexion. He was wearing a khaki jacket. <coughs> Do you understand? I understand, my lord. Thank you. The first guy went towards Kelly with a shorter one following him. The one with dreadlocks <coughs> breached the firearm and demanded the cell phones and money in Isizu. I just paused there. Did you get that? I understand, my lord. Uh, Let's say, for instance, a witness says when I crossed the intersection, the robot was red. Objection, my lord. The robot is irrelevant. What is the basis of the objection? Let Mr. Maloy get straight to the point uh, so that I respond. Uh, you, I can't have to be, you don't have to make an example about robots and everything. Yes. We're not dealing with robots here. Yes, uh, I, I'm just trying to give an example, my lord. That is yes. an irrelevant example. Yes, uh, if I can just make the point, my lord. Um, if a witness can submit, my lord, that. that, that that is not admissible. Yes, Mr. Yes, Lisi, you can continue. <clears throat> Thank you, my lord. In any event, my lord, I said you can continue. Thank you. Mm. I'm continuing, my lord. But before I continue, thank you, my lord. Well, the gist of what I'm putting it to you is the description. <coughs> that Mr. Longway gave when he gave his statement of the perpetrators or of the intruders that got into the house. We are not strange to this, we are investigating officer. That's correct, my lord. Thank you. Now, he says, the first intruder, that's now the person who was wielding a firearm, had dreadlocks, he was short and he was dark in complexion. Now, the second perpetrator, he says, he was tall and he was light in complexion. Do you understand? I understand, my Thank you. Now, I don't want to argue this point. This is information that was discovered to the defense by the state. In other words, it is this some of the basis on which the state decided to frog match this accused person to come before court here. It's a document that comes from the state itself. Do you understand? I understand. Thank you. The state also approached a facial image anal uh, analyst, um, Mrs. Tiene Camp. Let me just get her names. Um, Amanda Weiss Camp, 
She is a warrant officer who assisted the state in a compilation of identikits of the perpetrators who got into the house. She interviewed the people who were in the house and they went on to give her the description of the two intruders that got into the house. Do you follow? I'm following. Okay. Yeah, this is little. also information that came from the state. It is also a basis on which the state decided to how this accused person before court here. State can then not now disown this information. <coughs> but this is the point that I'm making. Mrs. Tienekamp, now this is a background. I hope you have it as investigating officer. Now Mr. Tienekamp went on to interview the people who were in the house. And the people in the house went on to give the description of what they saw on the perpetrators. And she went on the basis of that description, because she's an expert in this identity kit field, then she went on to compile this identity kit. Now, the first person that she interviewed, Ms. Yenekamp, I know this is here, so I'm going to request that it be provisionally admitted. Ms. Yenekamp will come and testify to this effect. That's my application, Manas. Now, Ms. Yenekamp, in her affidavit, this is what she said about the description that she got from the people that she interviewed as she wanted to compile <coughs> this identity kit. This is what she says. She says, amongst others, I interviewed several witnesses individually. My first witness was Kelly Kumar. Kelly told me in short that, sorry, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can see the state has been very considerate to assist uh, the witness with the cope of what I'm reading. Uh, thank you, Mr. Badoy, uh, Advocate Badoy. Um, Kelly told me, in short, that she and the deceased walked into, the, into a convenience store. Upon return, Kelly, the deceased, Family member and friends had a smoke outside their house. Miss Kumalo called them inside to say goodbye. They sat down and started chatting again. Kelly was sitting near the kitchen when she saw two unknown African males entering the house. Suspect A appeared very aggressive and demanded cell phones and money. Now, from the testimony of the witnesses in the house, we know that the person who demanded money, um, or we heard, not know, we heard that the person who demanded money from the occupants of their house and cell phone was the person that we let the firearm. Do you follow? I follow, my lord. Thank you. Now, this suspect approached Kelly, and the deceased jumped up towards suspect A. That now the suspect who demanded the money. A scaffold between suspect A and the deceased started. The next moment, Kelly had two gunshots. She gave the following description of suspect A. That he was an African male in his mid-twenties, dark brown, shiny complexion, dreadlock hairstyle, no scars, no facial hair, a golden insect in his upper teeth. The language that he spoke was a local Zulu. He was wearing a brown jacket with a woolen collar. He was not thin in appearance. Suspect A entered their house first. He was armed with an old black revolver. Kelly could not describe the second suspect. After compilation, she was satisfied with the ID kit. 
she compiled the face with the headgear. Did you get that? I understand, my lord. Thank you. Uh, so I wonder if Chiko Twala is going to do another interview because we hear here where Umnisi speaks about Ulongwe Twala and it seems that that is Chiko Twala's trigger. Anytime anyone talks about his dearly beloved son who was in the house at the time of Senzume was killing, he seems to have a, an adverse reaction to that and he's overwhelmed and needs a mic and he needs you know, the airwaves to broadcast what he has to say with regards to the case, especially the fact that, you know, he is Chikotwala and he has to say what he has to say. So Nisi was running down the the statement of the the officer who drew the suspects from based on the description of those who were in the house and she's going to come to court and he's going to cross examine her i'm not too sure why he was putting it across to this witness umaholo who oh yes he was putting it across to her because we you know you have to help her with her job as an investigating officer she doesn't read anything she's she's she was really more like an inda secretary doing just as one of my comments said one of the people in the comment section said she was just there to do the photocopying okay and submitting documents she was not really there to function as a fully fledged investigator so mzansi that is nisi and some highlights with regards to mentions of kelly kumalo um um what kelly kumalo saw in the house and also with regards to long Twala and his affidavit and but there seems to be some controversy there because he has given two different affidavits and then of course he went on netflix and said a whole lot more and then he did radio interviews but do you see a common pattern between father and son the apple does not fall far from the tree and that's it from us today please remember to like comment and subscribe and we'll catch you on our next upload